Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's healthcare provider program, Scalp Cooling and Breast Cancer Treatment, What Providers Need to Know. We're glad you could join us tonight. My name is Stephanie Washburn, and I'm the Manager of Healthcare Provider Outreach at Living Beyond Breast Cancer, or LBBC. I'm pleased to serve as your moderator tonight. In case you're just getting to know us at LBBC, we're a national nonprofit organization that offers trusted information and a community of support to people affected by breast cancer. We selected today's topic because of its importance to people with breast cancer and healthcare providers alike. Our speaker, Elahe Salahi of Dana-Farber Cancer Institute will help us understand the goals of scalp cooling, how it works and who is eligible, its impact on patients' quality of life, best practices for health systems, and more. We thank Ella Hay for sharing her time and expertise with us today. You'll learn more about her shortly. I'd like to extend a special thanks to our sponsor, Paxman, for their support of this program. Now let's cover a few final details before the presentation. Today we'll be using the chat feature to connect during the program. You'll see the chat icon at the bottom of your screen. We'll also be using the Q&A feature, which is located at the bottom of your screen as well. Please submit questions to the speakers through the Q&A at any time. We ask that you frame your questions in a general way so they can be helpful to all participants. We'll respond to as many questions as possible following the presentation. For participants who would like to use closed captioning, you can select this feature by clicking the up arrow button next to closed caption or live transcript at the bottom of your screen. Then click show subtitles to start displaying the captions. We'll be emailing you a link to the evaluation after the program. Your feedback is very important to us in planning future healthcare provider webinar programs, and we appreciate you taking the time to share your input. While we're unable to provide continuing education for this program, certificates of participation will be available upon request through the evaluation process. To receive a certificate, you are required to participate in the entire live webinar and complete the evaluation by April 19th. You will then be emailed your certificate by May 10th. We are recording the session and will post it on lbbc.org about a week from today. We'll notify you via email when the recording is available. We'd like to draw your attention to several LBBC resources that we hope will be helpful to you. You'll receive links by email after the program so you can share the information with your patients and colleagues. We have several blogs and videos with people who share their experiences with scalp cooling and how having a support system helped. We also bring you perspectives on finding wigs for Black women in treatment. I'd also like to highlight our upcoming virtual conference on metastatic breast cancer, which will take place April 23rd and 24th. This powerful event has provided people living with metastatic breast cancer and their families a dedicated space to gather trusted information and a community of support for 16 years. We hope that you and your patients can join us. It's now my pleasure to introduce Richard Paxman, who will in turn introduce you to our featured speaker, Elahe Salahi. Rich will also join us for the Q&A portion of the program. Rich is the Chief Executive Officer of Paxman Scalp Cooling, Global Leader in Scalp Cooling to Prevent Chemotherapy-Induced Alopecia. Rich studied management science at the University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology and joined Paxman in 2008. Since then, the business has had international success and Rich is passionate about improving scalp cooling efficacy, ensuring that everyone undergoing chemotherapy treatment keeps their hair and empowering cancer patients with a choice. It is Rich's vision to ensure that every applicable cancer patient, no matter where in the world, has the opportunity to maintain their privacy and sense of normality by keeping their hair. Rich, please feel free to join us on screen. Thank you very much, Stephanie, for the kind introduction. 
Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, an absolute honour to be here tonight and to be able to introduce our wonderful guests for the evening. Um, I want to thank LBBC for the invitation and making this happen. So excited to be here tonight. Uh, some of you may already know that my family has been passionate about scalp cooling for now well over 20 years. We've seen firsthand the impact of hair loss has on a patient and also their families, you know, whether it's husband and wife, young children. Following the loss of my mother, um, it really is our mission to make sure that no matter where you are in the world, no matter what your income, which is incredibly important, you have access to this side effect treatment. So we've spent the last 20 years, not only developing the technology, improving it for our patients, but also carrying out extensive clinical trials around the world to really make sure that this is as inclusive as possible, but more recently focusing on market access. So all patients can be benefit from this treatment, not just those who can afford. We have so much more to do, but I believe with your support, we can make this a standard of care and a choice for your patients in the future, like many other supportive care measures. It's with my absolute pleasure to introduce the wonderful Ella, Ella Hay Sali uh, from the Dana-Farber Dana Cancer Institute. Ella Hay, who I've known now for a, 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 some time, is um, currently working as an oncology nurse practitioner for the Department of Breast Oncology at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Her research focuses on improving the experience and safety of receiving cancer-directed therapies with a focus on reducing toxicity and improving quality of life. She has designed and implemented scalp cooling breast practice guidelines and policies at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and is the principal investigator of DFHCC trial 21169, which translates for us to assessing the impact of scalp cooling in patients with metastatic, metastatic breast cancer. Ella Hay began her nursing career in inpatient oncology where she developed a passion for all oncology patients. She continued her career in the ambulatory oncology settings. And for the last 12 years, her focus has been on providing care to breast cancer patients from initial diagnosis right through to end of life care. She was honored by one of her young breast cancer patients by inclusion in the 2017 Salute to Nurses in the Boston Globe. She is the recipient of the 2019 Dana-Farber President's Award for Nursing Excellence, presented by the Dana-Farber Nursing and Patient Care Services Department. Ella Hay received her Bachelor of Science in Nursing at Ryerson University in 2002, MSNMP or Adult Oncology at Yale School of Nursing in 2006, and Doctor of Nursing Practice at MGH Institution of Health Professions in 2019. She's board certified as a nurse practitioner through the American Nurses Credentialing Center, uh, also known as Wonder Woman, as you can probably tell from her um, impressive resume. So without further ado, I will now hand over things to Ella Hay and uh, please join us on screen and share your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard, for this wonderful introduction. And thank you for LLBC for inviting me um, to talk about this really important topic in supportive care for our breast cancer population. Um, we briefly, um, in the introduction, um, Stephanie, um, talked about our objectives. Um, I'm hoping that at the end of this presentation, um, we all can um, discuss further about the goals of scalp cooling, the relevance of breast cancer patients, how does it work, and who will be the best eligible person to receive it, the impact of scalp cooling on hair preservation, and most importantly, also in quality of care and quality of life. Um, the patient experience, it's important as the provider experience too, the cost and the resources, as well as the best practice guidelines. Sorry, I'm having trouble with, okay, perfect. 
Um, just um, briefly a background about approximately 253,000 people are diagnosed yearly with breast cancer. And unfortunately, this number is rising. About half of them find the hair loss to be one of the most dramatic aspects of their treatment. And then up to 10% decline chemotherapy treatment for this reason. Chemotherapy-induced alopecia is defined in common terminology, um, criteria for adverse events. There are up-to-date two um, devices that has been approved by FDA. One is Dignicap that was approved in 2015, and then later on Paxman in 2017. After the approval of FDA for these two um, scalp cooling devices, the NCCN guideline added preoperative and adjuvant setting for early stage breast cancer. Providers can consider scalp cooling to reduce the incidence of chemotherapy alopecia for patients receiving chemotherapy. Um, they also noted that the results of um, effectiveness using the anthracycline containing regimens has a little bit of a less effect than the rest of um, other chemotherapy agents. And then later on, um, scalp cooling did get approved not only for breast cancer patients, but also for solid tumors. And then therefore, they added a category to A um, that providers can offer this not only to breast cancer patients, but also to ovarian cancer, um, fallopian, as well as primary peritoneal cancer to reduce the incidence of chemotherapy. So how does it usually work? So it works by providing and introducing this really, really cold temperatures um, to induce the vasoconstriction. As a result of this, it decreases the metabolic activity, therefore less effect of these agents on the follicular cell level. In order for it to be effective, the device must be applied about 30 minutes prior to the actual chemotherapy. It will continue for the entire duration of the treatment and then up to 90 minutes after the treatment, which is the post-cooling time, an important time. Of course, there are other factors that will be contributing to the efficacy of scalp cooling. One of them is the correct size of the cap. This is one of the very important aspects of scalp cooling to be effective. The better the cap size is and the fitting that is being fitted closely to the hair is actually has a better outcome um, as a result. The texture is important. So people with a very thick texture has a little bit of a difficult um, in introducing the cold temperatures and penetrating all the way to the scalp. Race also plays a role. So we really have limited um, information and data about our African-American Hispanic population, which we really need to look into this further. And then also cancer biology. Um, you know, most of our African-American population who get diagnosed with breast cancer, they're mostly young age with triple negative breast cancer that requires really anthracycline based regimen, which we'll see later on has a less effect um, than um, the other chemotherapy agents. So therefore, cancer biology does play a role in this. Now, I can say at Dana-Farber very freely that um, introducing scalp cooling to our early stage breast cancer patient is actually standard of care. We really are introducing it to our patients. Some of our patients actually come already knowing um, what to ask about the scalp cooling. However, um, it's not standardly offered in our metastatic population. And yet the hair loss continues to be a very dramatic aspect of treatment. Even forget about being a cancer patient, alopecia overall is really an uncomfortable um, and uh, disturbing event that happens in somebody's life. Man or woman, it does not matter. Um, and also um, we don't have data about the agents that are used in metastatic setting. We have data that we use in our adjuvant or neoadjuvant population, but not really in our metastatic breast cancer. 
And some of these newer agents that is out there for, in, for example, antibody drug conjugates, really no data to date. So um, scalp cooling, as you can see, this is um, it's, um, the machine for the scalp cooling. This is a single machine. They do come in dual machine and that can be actually hooked up one machine to two patients. Um, and it's an inner and an outer cap. So this is the inner cap. The inner cap carries the gel that keeps the cooling. And they come in a different sizes, small, medium, and large. And it's important to get the fitting component that you choose the correct size for your patients in order to be most effective. And then you have an outer cap with a chin wrap. And, and the outer cap came, it comes exactly small, medium, and large, and usually go side by side together. So you have an inner small, and you will have an, an outer um, small cap as well. In some of the cases when you know the um, size is a little bit in the middle, what sometimes um, we have found that it has been helpful is that um, using a smaller inner cap and going with a slightly larger outer cap. And then the chin wrap is important. The chin wrap is really one of the part of that. We want to make sure that um, there is a consistency of all over the cap that patients can actually feel. And um, of course, the chin wrap is not there for, for the patients to be uncomfortable or not be able to eat or drink or even talk. Um, uh, but it is an important factor to make sure that we have that on our patients. Um, and also there is the connector. It's a very easy user-friendly um, machine to, um, to have, to be honest. And now I would like to turn it on um, to um, a brief um, video that we are going to be looking at. Um, and I'm gonna stop my sharing.
Thank you. What a wonderful video um, about Paxman. Incredible work. So let's let's talk about studies. There are um, many studies that has um, looked into scalp cooling, and as you know, in Europe, scalp cooling has been out there for over decades. Um, I'm going to focus only on two studies due to the time, um, and there are very important studies. Um, Rugo et al. Um, did a prospective study. It was a multicentral study that looked into women with stage one and stage two breast cancer, both in neoadjuvant and um, adjuvant setting, who received most of the chemotherapy was dosetaxel and cyclophosphamide up to 75%. Few percent of 12% was about pactitaxel and 12% was your dosetaxel, carboplatin and trastuzumab. And what they did see in the study that hair loss of less than 50% was seen in over 67% of the patient in the scalp cooling compared to 0% in the control group. They used the DEAN score um, to affect and to assess the alopecia. And the DEAN score was somewhere between zero and two. So that means less than 50% of the hair loss. They did not see any differences based on the patient characteristics. They also did quality of care measures. They used five quality of care measures and three out of them actually showed some improvement overall of the quality of life. It's about 27% of patients in scalp cooling felt that physically that they were less attractive compared to the 56% in the control arm. So it was not statistically significant, but as you can see, there was some quality of life measure. What they did see is that the quality of life that was done after a month following completion of the chemotherapy though, did show better quality of life in patients. Um, just to head back to the previous one, it's important to say that abstract was presented in ASCO back in 2015, and this study led to FDA approval for Dignicap. Later on, Nanja et al. did um, a study um, looking at um, scalp cooling versus control arm. This was a randomized study. Um, it has seven sites that was involved in the United States. So it was a big study. It's about 142. There were evaluable patients randomized to these groups. Um, they did use adjuvant anthracycline or taxane based therapies were a little bit different than the other study. What they saw it was about 67% of this population did use um, taxanes and about 36% use anthracycline based treatment. And about 50% did show some success in her preservation compared to the control arm. They did use CTACAE version four for their alopecia assessment, and their grading were somewhere between zero and one. What also they did compare, it was the efficacy between the taxane and anthracycline based regimens. And 59% did show a higher efficacy rate when it's used with the taxane and 16% kind of much lower percent for anthracycline based. They also did a few questionnaires, both at the baseline and then four weeks after completion of their treatment, but did not show any quality of life. This did um, this study actually was terminated early because of the great success and led to FDA approval of Paxman in 2017. This is a great um, data uh, from uh, Dutch registry that I thought that it would be good to show um, as there are multiple other chemotherapy agents that we do use in our breast cancer population. As you can see, your dosetaxel and taxol, um, they did have a higher rate of success rate with the use of scalp cooling. Um, but when you look at the dose dense taxol and your carboplatin with the AUC of six, 
um, or your adriamycin and cytoxin, the success rate was not as high as the taxane chemotherapy agents. The other thing that you can see in this um, data is that the higher the dose, the less efficacy can be. So I think, again, we need more data in higher dosage, dose-dense um, chemotherapy regimens as well. It is very safe to uh, provide this to our patients. Um, the scalp metastasis, it has been reported and published, but the incident is extremely rare um, and low. That is absolutely fine um, to use this and introduce scalp pulling to your patient population. Um, it is contra contraindicated with hematological malignancy and cold sensitivity. I do get a lot of um, questions in regards to oxyplatin toxicity. And yes, um, we, we do not try to offer this to our patients because of the cold sensitivity reason. But it is tolerated so well amongst most of our patients. Of course, the cold sensation can be a little bit problematic, but it is very important to let patients know that the cold sensitivity is really bothersome within the first 10 to 15 minutes. And then after really patient's scalp tolerates the, um, the cold sensation quite well. Headaches and migraines. So because of the cold sensitivity, patients do complain about mild headaches. People who do have some history of migraine, whether they're active or inactive, it might trigger their migraine, uh, migraine. So therefore, we tell our patients to take Tylenol or Advil. So whatever they take for their migraine is really those PRN uh, medications um, help with the tolerability of the scalp cooling. And then some patients complain about nausea, which I think is multifactorial, right? You have your chemotherapy, you have, you have the anxiety of starting uh, the chemo agents. On top of that, the scalp cooling, the headache does uh, uh, cause some mild nausea. Again, is really mild and patient overall tolerated with the PRN medications. What's the cost? Um, it really depends on the chemotherapy regimen because it depends on the cycles of how many cycles patients receive. The maximum is 2,200. Unfortunately, currently not generally reimbursed despite the FDA approval. Um, some insurance company will require some submitting of medical necessity letter, which Paxman has a fantastic medical necessity form and letter with it that you can, um, you can provide um, to the insurance and then patient pay up front. And then what happens is that the insurance will calculate and give some back. I have to say, I have not seen great success in this, but I'm hopeful. I'm very hopeful, especially with the new CMS uh, reassignment of repayment for scalp cooling that came out recently, um, January of this year. So I think we are going to the right direction. There is a light and I, um, I really feel that it's going to be a standard of care all across and most of the insurances and hopefully all will actually um, pay for this standard of care. Um, some financial aid is available. So at Dana-Farber, we do have a financial aid availability. Um, we um, have application that we offer the patients during the referral. At the end of this presentation, you will get more information about this. So stay tuned, please. So how does it all start it? How does it all start it at Dana-Farber? We had so many patients coming in um, who really wanted to have scalp cooling um, because they really did not want it to experience alopecia. They were bringing their own dry eyes, which uh, mostly you all are aware that they're really hard um, to, to bring in because they are heavy and um, it needs to be changed according to the temperature. So it was hard on the patient, it was hard for the caregiver. Um, and sometimes they bring their husband to do that. So it, it was overall not a pleasant thing for patients to go through when they already have the diagnosis of cancer. So what we decided to do in November of 2017, we did meet both with 
um, the two um, uh, Paxman and um, the other um, company. And we decided to go with Paxman, um, very user-friendly machine. Um, and we started to um, build um, this pilot study with very, very few amount of patients and very few amount of physicians. We did not want it to just start big. We wanted to go slow, which I think it really helped um, for overall the plan. And what we did is that we, we kind of came up with an Outlook calendar um, email that it was sent to the scheduling and it was specific scheduling uh, people who will take care of patients who were going through the scalp cooling because we wanted to make sure that we, they have all of the entire schedule set up due to the time. Um, we also developed um, um, a cart, actually. We developed a cart um, that had all of the aspect of um, Paxman um, fitting as well as documentations um, in one area, which we felt that it was more appropriate. Um, we made packages that we placed in every single room um, in our clinic that would be used. About approximately up to 100 patients were enrolled. So first small amount, and then we opened up to our entire breast oncology group. And we have a very, very big um, breast oncology group. We have about 26 just breast medical oncologists. Um, it was patient as well as provider driven. Um, the success really depended on what type of regimen we use for our patients and about our data in um, Taxol and Herceptin, um, about 80% success rate. And I can say that it's minimum 80% success rate. Really patients do quite well with the taxane regimen. So parallel to this, um, I was also getting my doctorate degree. And when you start a pilot study in a large institution, what happens is that, you know, you get the positives and you also get things that have not worked. And you want to make sure that you bring the best practices for your patients. So what was best for me is to just look and redesigning the practice guideline, redesigning the policies. I have to give a big shout out to our clinical nurse specialist, Suzanne Connolly, that really helped me develop um, and redesign this process as well. Um, so what we did is that when I, I basically said, what's the best way to do this? Um, and that was a qualitative approach. Um, taking a qualitative approach, doing open-ended question and making focus groups and only with infusion nurses, because I think the main um, success stories really came from our infusion. In the beginning, the infusion nurses really didn't know too much about the scalp cooling. And with the pilot study, they learned a lot and they were able to give us a better feedback about what we can do to best provide this and increase the efficacy. So we did the focus group and um, basically what came out through the data is four themes. Um, workflow, what was working. Workflow of needs improvement, patient experience, as well as nursing satisfaction. What else that came out in this study, which was really important to um, to share is that patients and provider educations, as well as um, setting the rules of expectations were the primary factors that most influenced the improving of the efficacy in scalp cooling, as well as degree, decreasing the anxiety level of our patients. So what we did with the um, with this study and what the outcome was, we really changed the entire um, design and we redesigned it to better uh, serve our patient population. We created the educational module. It was a standardized educational module for our patients as well as nursing. What we saw in the pilot study, it was that education was a key factor. So we needed to bring time to, um, for our nurses to actually sit down with our patients and review these informations. We also asked them to bring the family members. Patients are so nervous during this time. They've just been diagnosed with breast cancer. 
they need chemotherapy, they have all of these side effects you want to talk about, and then on top of that, using the use of scalp cooling. So they usually don't hear whatever we have to say. So it's important to ask them to bring a family member. So what we did is that we, we carved out time for the fitting and we included this information session at the same time. Um, we did um, nursing in service as well as provider in service. We wanted to make sure that our providers are in the same side as our nursing. So we all are sharing the same information. We do not need to make things more complicated um, and misleading. Um, we had ongoing discussion. We um, shared our breast oncology efficacy data on a constantly level. And what we did realize is that the cooling time is one of the important time about um, the chair time, right? So in an outpatient setting, the chair time is really important. And if you have a cooling time for about up to 90 minutes, um, it, it's really a long duration of keeping that chair. So what we did is that we find out an additional space for the patients when they finish their chemotherapy, they can move on for their post-cooling time. That really helped the chair time. Um, and what we also did is that after it was uh, approved for the entire solid tumors, we built a program and we went to every single solid tumor um, disease center and we gave an in-service. And during this um, pilot, we also realized that using the PRN medication really helped our patients um, to tolerate the scalp cooling and therefore increase the efficacy of it because patients are keeping them longer. So what we did is that in order for the nurses to constantly keep paging us, we decided to come up with an oncology therapy plan. In the oncology therapy plan, all of these PRN medications were included and activated when you activate and put an order in for your scalp cooling. Therefore, the nurses had the authority to just go in and give the medication that is needed for patients without wasting any time paging or waiting for a um, phone call from the provider. And I have to say about 95% of all of our population really do use Ativan prior to the scalp cooling. It really helps them relax for that 10 to first 15 minutes um, that is very cold and a little bit difficult to tolerate. Then we wanted to take it a little bit further. And we decided um, to look not only on the efficacy of scalp cooling more, but also in the, uh, importantly, in quality of life and body image. And not only in our adjuvant setting or early stage breast cancer, but also in our metastatic breast cancer patient that we really do not have data. The important also factor was not only looking at the chemo agents that we give, but what about the new agents? We all know the trajectory of breast cancer treatment has quite changed in a positive way and is amazing to see that transition in all subtypes of our breast cancer, whether it's hormone receptor positive, whether it's HER2 mu positive, or whether it's our triple negative. The antibody drug conjugates are a promising factors for our patient's population. And it's great that we look into that data more so that brought us to think about what regimens should we look into. And what we are hoping is that this study that we are running in to look at the efficacy of scalp cooling in our metastatic population kind of be a foundation for more studies to rise. So the three agents that we felt that it would be more appropriate to start with is sasetuzumab govitecan. As we, as you all know, this is an, an antibody that targets the drop two receptor U, and we see that receptor in our triple negative me, me, breast cancer patients. And it's been used and FDA approved for triple negative breast cancer patients. And the randomized phase three ASCEN trial has showed significant grade progression free survival and overall survival. So we know that is a benefit drug. We know that now we can even use in our second line treatment, the NCCN guidelines, per NCCN guidelines. And the alopecia rate, there is about 46%. 
in the ascent trial. I have to say that personally, in my experience, the alopecia rate is really higher than 46% for satsuzumab bovitecan. So it's something that we need to look further deep into. The second is trastuzumab deroxican, which is, um, and again, an hand to, uh, antibody drug conjugate into her two directed therapy for metastatic um, her two positive breast cancer that FDA has approved, great overall response rate in destiny trials. So there are so many death trials going on, but the alopecia rate that mentioned in here was destiny breast the one that um, rated 48%. And then we looked at the um, arubilin, our actual chemotherapy agents that we have been using in metastatic breast cancer patients for a while, and they have shown overall survival benefit. In our EMBRACE trial at Dana-Farber, what we have found is that estimated about 60% hair loss um, with the arubilin drug. So we hypothesize that using scalp cooling will lower the rate of alopecia in these three regimens when it's used. Therefore, will improve quality of life. Our uh, primary objective is the efficacy, so hair preservation, and then secondary objective is quality of life. We are using two quality of life in this clinical trial, which is, first of all, one is CADS, which is chemotherapy-induced alopecia distress scale. I like this scale because it actually has domains and um, that will really fit into our breast cancer population. And then a body um, image scale questionnaire. So this is a prospective um, clinical trial that looked at the efficacy. We do use the Paxman scalp cooling, and I want to give a shout out to Rich, who has really helped us through this process and advocated. Um, and uh, we're using the three, one of the three agents. They have to be metastatic breast cancer, so they need a metastatic breast cancer diagnosis to go under this clinical trial using one of these agents. We are hoping to recruit about 40 patients in each arm, and each arm actually divides to 20 patients will receive the scalp pooling and 20 patients will um, have no scalp pooling for a total of 120 participants. This is um, a patient-centered trial, so patients will elect to which arm they would like to go, whether scalp pooling or no scalp pooling. Um, the hair loss is measured at the baseline. We take pictures. We also will do questionnaires. Um, and at the, the, at the baseline, cycle three, cycle five, day one, um, until the progression, uh, disease progression or um, discontinuation due to toxicity. We are using the CCIC criteria for our um, alopecia assessment. And then the quality of life that I measured will be done at the same time um, at uh, the uh, pictures. This is just a brief um, schema. They get registered, one of these three agents, um, and then they will decide which group they would like to be. And again, this is not a randomized clinical trial. We really wanted this to be patient's choice. So at the conclusion, um, it is really effective. I have seen this, I have seen the success and I continue to see the success and um, the happiness in my patient's eyes. So it is very effective, especially in taxanes. It's extremely well tolerated. So do not worry about the patients is not able to tolerate. They're very, very, few handful of patients were not able to tolerate. And yes, you will see them as you have more patients going through scalp cooling, but the majority of population really tolerates this quite well. Please consider the PRN medications. Those are really great success to improve the outcome for our patients and allow them to use this supportive care measure. 
Um, it does improve, improve quality of life and body image. There are so many European studies that done and has shown that there is a quality of life and body image improvement with the use of scalp cooling. What we did see is that education is a key factor. Educating your nurses, educating your patients, educating your providers, educating their family members are really key components. Expectations, be upfront with the patients about the expectations of the effectiveness. Use the data that you have to show them what will be the outcome of using the scalp cooling with the agents of that they were really receiving. The last thing we want to see in our patients' eyes is um, the disappointment that, oh, you did not tell me about what to expect. So I think setting up expectations up front, giving the proper education that is need is a key factor. Um, fitting, fitting is a really important factor for our patients. We really want to make sure that we see more efficacy with the scalp cooling, therefore better fitting. Finance continues to be an issue. I am hopeful, I am really hopeful that the insurance companies will start um, to see this as um, standard of care and start to cover this for our patients, especially with the new Medicare guidelines that is out there. Um, we need to do more. Um, uh, we need to have more data. We need to have more studies, um, especially in African-American population and Hispanic population. Um, and also in our noble agent. So I'm hoping that um, we'll continue to improve our process about scalp cooling and we'll continue to offer this to more of our patients. And, and with that, I am concluding this presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you so much, um, Ella Hay. And let's welcome Rich back onto the screen. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing all of your insights, your experience, that was fascinating information. Um, Rich, thank you for answering so many of the questions as well. That's fantastic. And we have just under 10 minutes for live Q&A now with the audience. Um, and I did, so I tried my best to keep track of them. There are a ton of questions. This is an inquisitive audience, which is wonderful. Um, so we'll get to as many as we can. And Rich, I wanted to start with one that I believe you flagged to answer live. And I would um, defer to either you or Elahe, or perhaps both of you to answer this one to get us started. Um, and that one was uh, related to headaches and migraines um, during the experience of scalp cooling. And I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more to that. Yeah, I have to apologize. I, uh, I speedily pressed answer live as opposed to type an answer. Um, so that wasn't the plan. But ultimately, we believe that that first 10 to 15 minutes is where a patient may experience a headache. I can't really talk too much to migraines because I think, you know, that's a, a quite a different thing than a, a headache. But most patients tolerate it pretty well um, after that 15 minutes. But I think Ella here will probably have a, a clearer picture in clinic than I do personally. Sure. Um, so, um, yes, I agree with Rich. Um, the headache is really mild. Even a Tylenol ibuprofen takes care of it immediately. Yeah. Even with our patients who have active migraine, um, we ask them to take their migraine medication beforehand and they do tolerate it and they go through it very nicely. Even with my study that I'm doing right now, um, if a patient is actively have migraine but still is taking the medication, we, we, we do actually put them on trial. And let me tell you, they are doing good. So I think that the migraine and headache especially is mild, but make sure that you have your as needed medication and that is your supportive care. Okay, great. Thanks so much for answering that. Um, there were some interesting questions. And, and again, Rich, I know you answered some of these in the chat, but I'm thinking that all of the audience um, might not have seen that. So I wanted to revisit some of them. And there were some interesting ones related to regrowth and what's being seen with that. And um, perhaps related, um, at, least, at least in some way, what do you see as far as the texture and thickness of hair um, for people who have scalp cooling as the hair regrows? 
So from my perspective, then there's there's probably three or four really good papers now that have been published about regrowth. A number of them actually out of India and and Japan, and then anecdotally, I think we see regrowth quite quite commonly. So those patients that scalp cool, even when they don't see perhaps the retention that they'd hoped for, have much faster, fuller, thicker regrowth. Um, and, and it's getting back to that normality, I think, quicker, filling in that, those, those bold spots. So, you know, what we're seeing uh, from, from the patients that use our device, they're seeing that as a real driver now to actually say, do you know what, even if my retention might not be what I would really like, ultimately, if I see that regrowth and get back to that normality quite quicker, I will be happy. Um, in terms of texture and, and density, I guess, you know, texture does change of the hair based on the chemotherapy, um, but we expect that to fill in and, and, and become as what it was in time. Ella here. No, I agree with you 100%. So our um, Taxol patients, I have to say, um, they really keep their hair. So um, uh, I barely see thinning of their hair. So uh, the texture is really continued to be the same and the thickness is continued to be the same. For our TC population, um, which has a less efficacy that we have seen, um, and you, you do see some thinning. Um, and again, when you complete the chemotherapy, they're really, their hair grow back as thick as it was before. So, um, it, which is great because most of the patients with TC, they're like, okay, I might've lost about, you know, 50% or 45% of my hair, but I know that is going to grow back and it's going to grow back exactly how my hair was and how thick it was. Great. Thank you so much. I feel like you're really helping people see what this looks like for patients. And I appreciate you, you both doing that. Um, Going back to some questions that came in earlier, and this is something that you addressed, Elahe, I just thought there might be a little bit more um, that we, we could add because a couple people asked about it, which, which goes back to the question of race, ethnicity, and scalp cooling. And um, somebody had, had asked, uh, you know, why, why is that a factor? And what are some of the things being done to address the barriers related to, to capturing data on, on that? So I wondered if either or both of you could comment a little bit more on that one. Um, sure, I think, um, so one of the main things is about the thickness of the hair. So when your hair is really, really thick, the penetration of that coldness is going to be less to the scalp. So that's why um, that race of ethnicity plays a role in that. The cancer biology also plays a role in the race and ethnicity. Again, it goes hand by hand because our African-American population are mostly diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer. We know triple negative breast cancer. It is a more aggressive type of breast cancer that require enterocyclin-based chemotherapy regimen, which has lower um, efficacy by using the scalp cooling. Um, what are we doing? I think we're starting to look at this population more, and um, and I'm hoping that you know with the studies that we have out there with the metastatic po patient population, we can absolutely look at more of the uh, this specific population. Um, and and I know that with um, the studies that were done. Um, the population of African American was really, really small compared to white. So it was kind of like nine to ten percent compared to seventy percent. So I think we need to increase that more. Um, and one of the ways we can do that is to educate our population, educate our African American Hispanic population. Sometimes um, socioeconomic factors can play a role in this, um, and sometimes is the language barriers that can. Um, play a role in this. So I think that if we, if we take away those barriers, I think more and more of patients who are within Hispanic and African-American population will be part of this. Thank you, Elahe, and I, I can echo what she says, but it, it's a really important piece of, of work that Paxman are, are trying to do at the moment, and we, and we put that up as one of our, our key priorities. So we have um, about, we're about to open a clinical trial at Montefiore at the Albert Einstein, um, looking specifically at types three and four hair, um, so patient, patients of color, um, really understanding what we need to do to improve the efficacy. So how do we educate? How do we care for the hair? 
um, and how do we prepare a patient's hair to start scalp cooling? So it's very different than, than sort of types one and two hair. So that's critical. In addition to that, we're about to launch new guidance on our website. So, you know, we've very much focused over the years, wrongly or rightly, on, on sort of middle-aged white women, I'll be honest, types one and two hair. And actually that's where a lot of our education has been. And, and now we've taken a step back and said, that's not right. That's not what we should be doing. So we've really opened that up to a more diverse and inclusive approach. So we've got lots more ages, different ethnicities, men and women, all really important and all giving more tailored and personalized ad advice so we can get the best possible results, which is something that we're really passionate about. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you both so much for, for giving some more uh, comments and feedback on that, that very important topic. And somehow we are approaching the end of our program. So I just want to take a couple minutes to, um, to close this out. I want to thank the audience for your unbelievable questions. I'm really impressed by them, by the volume, and thank you for being so engaged throughout the program. Uh, and on behalf of Living Beyond Breast Cancer, I want to offer our gratitude to you, Ella Hay, uh, for sharing your expertise and your insights tonight, and Rich for sharing yours as well, and for your support of this program. We are so grateful to both of you. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to share one more resource with everybody before we wrap up in just a few minutes. So today, um, Ella Hay covered the expenses associated with scalp cooling, and I know there were some questions also related to resources that came into the chat in the Q&A. There is a great program through Char Charette, a nonprofit cancer organization, uh, and they have a program that can help, which is called Best Face Forward 2.0. This program provides subsidies for non-medical services that are critical to a woman's quality of life and body image. Best Face Forward 2.0 includes financial subsidies for cold caps and wigs, among other services. To qualify, patients must be diagnosed with or be considered high risk for breast or ovarian cancer. They also have to meet financial eligibility guidelines. For more information, you can visit Best Face Forward 2.0's landing page, which you see at the bottom of the screen. And we're also going to be sending you an email very soon after the program with a link to this resource as well. So we'll hope that you'll check that out and, and take advantage of what's being offered by Charcherette. Also, as a reminder, you'll receive our evaluation via email shortly. Please remember to complete it no later than April 19th. And for those of you who request a certificate of participation, you'll be emailed that certificate by May 10th. And we'll also send a link to the program recording within about a week, as well as Ella Hayes slides. So again, thank you all for participating in tonight's program and for the care you provide to people affected by breast cancer. We hope that you'll join us for future educational programs. Please take good care and enjoy the rest of your evening.